Thanks a lot for inviting me here for the introduction. It's really a great honor, uh, especially because um, I, I really had dinner yesterday evening with Professor Kirvan, and it does not come every day that you give a lecture and you have dinner with <laughs> the person who name, whose name is attached to the lecture. That's great. And uh, let's see, I'm not a mathematician, but I'll, I'll speak um, about things that I think are kind of applied mathematics. Um, I would like to think uh, as artificial intelligence, at least some parts of it, as um, applied math. Um, I'll first motivate this. I've, this was um, an undergraduate seminar. And then I'll do some mathematics at the end. Um, so let me first start with things you probably know, or several of you know, about re recent successes on mostly uh, the engineering of intelligence. Um, you know, the title of my talk is The Science and the Engineering of Intelligence. I think of the problem of intelligence as one of the great problems in science, at the same level as, uh, you know, the origin of the universe or the structure of space and time. Um, the origin of life. Um, this is about how our brain works, how our mind works, um, you know, what we are. So it's certainly a great problem. One could even argue it's the greatest of all because if you can make any progress on it and you can therefore make machines that help you think better or maybe you, c you can make yourself smarter, then you can more easily solve all other great problems. So the priority. But in recent years, there has been quite a few successes on the engineering side. It started probably uh, 15 years ago or so, 18 years ago actually, uh, 97, with Deep Blue beating Kasparov, the world champion of chess at the time. And, and then uh, at the beginning of modern history, so to speak, five years ago, we had uh, Watson, also IBM, beating world champions of Jeopardy, this uh, uh, game. But in the last two years or so, there has been a flurry of results. Um, there was a paper in Nature less than two years ago about a system called uh, Deep Q that learned to play Atari games by himself um, with inputs just what is on the screen and ended up playing um, many of 40 or so games better than humans. This was done at DeepMind, which is now a company, um, part of Google. And DeepMind was started by Demis Asabis, who was uh, a postdoc with me for a, for a short time. Um, and more recently, um, there was a series of paper in high impact journals like Nature and Science about uh, deep learning and uh, about uh, system developed by a collaborator of mine, Josh Tenenbaum, for recognizing handwritten characters. And uh, most of the, uh, a lot of the publicity came uh, a couple of months ago. This is Demis, a caricature of Demis Asabis. Uh, when uh, when uh, AlphaGo, a system developed by DeepMind um, won against uh, the kind of semi-official world champion of Go in a competition in Seoul. These were some images from that competition. I was there for the last game. Um, and uh, uh, on the right, it's uh, Demis and Lee Seidel at the press conference after the last game. It was quite exciting, it was historic. Um, at the time of Deep Blue winning at chess, experts in artificial intelligence thought Go was going to be, you know, 50 years away at least, because so much more complex than chess. Um, it's a very simple game in terms of the rules, uh, 
but the combinatorics is such that while for chess you can essentially computer today can list all possible configurations of the chessboard, in Go it's impossible because the number of um, chessboard configurations are more, much more than the number of atoms in the universe. So you have to, to have a different approach, it's not brute force. Um, and in fact, involves a lot of pattern recognition, um, recognizing situations that are strategically good or bad for the player. And um, also interestingly, the system was initially trained with uh, uh, about 100,000 games that humans play that are available, um, good human players, but then the, the, most of the progress was done when the system was um, made play against itself or tweaked version of itself. So learning to play in a way that wins. Uh, it's a technique called the reinforcement learning. And so it became uh, quickly uh, much better and is still improving. So there is not yet a saturation point in its uh, performance. So we'll see relatively soon, it's not official, but I know that China has kind of challenged um, AlphaGo to play against the Chinese champion of Go. So there will be probably in a couple of months or so there may be uh, something like that playing out. So it's kind of a uh, golden age for artificial intelligence, especially machine learning. Um, this was something I saw today in, a, in some magazine, there are a lot of startups in Silicon Valley that get acquired uh, already two or three this year, um, and they're just at the beginning of doing some application of machine learning of artificial intelligence. So there have been a lot of progress, and it's not only in games. Um, you know, if you look around, you see, for instance, um, this is, I think, uh, the, um, um, X-47, which is a drone that a year or two ago landed for the first time by itself on an aircraft carrier, which is probably the most difficult thing for a human pilot to do. And uh, um, the same kind of machine learning techniques, deep learning, are also um, applied and they're already on the road to autonomous or semi-autonomous driving. This is another ex postdoc of mine, Amnon Shashua, is a professor at the Hebrew University and started a company called Mobileye, which provides the vision system that uh, is used in the several cars, including Tesla. So this is uh, what allows... Um, you And this is also, um, not sure it's is, uh, already, um, it's not in the Tesla yet, but this is a system at Mobileye, also based on machine learning that he has learned from millions of examples to find out the free space where there are no obstacles. And he magically founds for, finds, for instance, the curb on the right as something is a boundary. And uh, it's real time. It uses about 5% of the chip that Mobileye is selling. Um, so, so, by the way, this is uh, um, um, this is a very different approach from Google for autonomous driving because it's using Mobilize using vision sensors like we do when we drive, um, whereas Google is, is using LIDAR, which gives three-dimensional information through laser coherent optics. So it, it's a much different system. It's much more expensive. And uh, we'll see who, which approach is, 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 is better. I, I bet that uh, 
uh, it will be impossible to have completely autonomous driving like Google is driving to, to do in the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, so an incremental approach like Mobileye in which you have a smarter and smarter cruise control seems a much better way to approach for several reasons, including legal reason of who's going to be responsible for it. Yeah. And by the way, this is a, a small parenthesis on Moore's law for machine learning. Um, this was a project in my group um, 20 years ago. This was 95, was with Daimler, so Mercedes at the time. And this movie is a system that was trained um, to recognize pedestrians, and now it's uh, shown working in a, in a um, street in Ulm, in Germany. And uh, <coughs> you can see that this system makes some false detection of pedestrians. There is one around the traffic light, for instance. Uh, overall, we had one error every three frames or so, and at the time I was very happy, but one error every three frames is one is, you know, uh, 10, um, let's see, 10 errors per second, right? 30 frames per second. So it's completely unusable. Now Mobileye has an error rate of about one error every 30,000 kilometers of driving. So it's about a factor two improvement every year for 20 years. At the end, you end up with one million better performance. Um, it's interestingly, uh, many of these uh, successes, this especially machine learning, deep, learn, deep learning in particular, have their roots in neuroscience. Um, you know, Turing originally proposed Turing machines and wrote extensively about analogies with the brain. So a lot of these things come from thinking about the brain, and in particular, um, deep learning comes from relatively old ideas, 50 years ago or so, about visual cortex. So visual cortex is characteristic of primates like us, and uh, is these layers of tissues um, that are on the back of your head, and they are divided in areas like, like V1, and V2 and V4 and IT. So, um, so that's the back of, of the head of a monkey. And um, the information comes from the eye back to the back of the head and then travels uh, towards the front from V1 to V2 to V4 to IT. Um, where you have more complex representation. So here is like signal processing, getting more and more abstract and symbolic as you go from the back to the front. This is a kind of circuit diagram of this uh, series of areas, V1, V2, V4. Um, the size of these rectangles is about the number, proportional to the number of neurons, so it's about 200 million neurons in V1, 200 in V2, 50 in V4. This is the macaque monkey for a total of a bit less than one billion neurons in the visual cortex. Um, and um, about in the 60s, David Hubel and Thorsten Wiesel at Harvard recorded from neurons in V1, in primary visual cortex, and um, they find, found several interesting properties of them, and they proposed in, archi in architecture that um, is remarkably similar to deep learning today. They said we have cells in V1 that are like feature detectors or filters. Um, they're like Gabor-like filters, oriented filters in space, X and Y. Uh, you can think of them as detecting edges of different orientations, in a each one in a particular position of the visual field. And then you have another set of cells that they called complex cells, which are uh, kind of averaging together the output of several simple cells, which have the same specific specificity, they respond to edges of the same orientation, but are in different position. And through this operation, the 
complex cells inherit the same tuning to, for instance, an oblique uh, edge, but has some, more, some position invariance um, because of this pooling. Um, and, and, and they proposed an architecture that was repeating this kind of, of motifs, kind of features, like edges here, like maybe something more like corners here, and then pooling to get invariance with um, receptive fields of these cells. So this is the area of the image that stimulates them, getting larger and larger as you go higher up. Um, so there was a sequence of, of quantitative models following this suggestion of Huber and Wiesel. This is one which we developed several years ago. Um, and this is basically the architecture that you have in deep learning networks today. These multiple layers of filtering, nonlinear operation, and pooling. Um, you can show that uh, systems of this kind um, work pretty well, surprisingly well, for instance, in terms of um, doing as well as humans do on this task that is called rapid categorization. You have to say uh, whether in the image there is or there is not an animal. And uh, uh, people are overall about 80% correct, and these models are also about 80% correct. And they also share some of the similar performance. So images that are difficult for these models are difficult for humans, and images that are easy are easy for humans. So, um, so we have um, visual cortex, we have these models come from that, and deep learning, here are some, uh, some um, a schematic diagram of some of these um, networks. These are um, just a couple of years ago, some of the best performing ones on uh, image classification, categorization. This was the one that uh, kind of uh, made deep learning uh, famous because it performed much better than previous systems on a database called ImageNet, where you have one million of labeled images of about 1,000 different types of objects. Um, and it, this system are probably doing as well as humans on that kind of database. Um, as, and as I said, they're good enough to be used for autonomous driving, for several applications, at medical and so on, at Google and other companies. And they also perform well in other um, problems like, for instance, speech recognition or part of speech recognition systems. So we have this similar architecture. The, this is a schematic way, but it's essentially this architecture of, of uh, linear operations, filtering followed by a simple nonlinear operation, followed by pooling um, uh, some time, and then iterating this series of layers. And you may have up to 10 or even 100 of such layers. Now, <coughs> um, in, uh, um, this is the background. I'll come back to this in uh, um, the last 10 minutes of my talk. Here, I want to mention briefly that um, uh, um, David mentioned I'm in charge of the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, and our goal is more on the science rather than the engineering of intelligence. We really want to understand how the brain works and whether this may take us to better machines or not. That's a separate question. So, and I think it's important not to neglect science you know, there is a lot of engineering efforts on developing artificial intelligence. Of course, Google and Facebook and Microsoft and IBM are um, is investing a lot of resources. But there is the scientific part, which is important because we want to know how 
our mind works, our brain works, and because this will probably be important, the science, for the engineering of tomorrow, right? And, <coughs> and you know, here you can see, for instance, that uh, that artificial intelligence, for those, all the hype, has still a long way to go. Um, <laughs> this was uh, a competition that ARPA had. Um, <laughs> it's a bit unfair because it's not so much the intelligence, but really mechanical problems and material problems of various types. But just to make the point, um, there is still a lot of work to do for understanding how children um, develop and learn from the environment. Um, and, you know, neither uh, AlphaGo or the mobilized system can be so flexible to answer uh, all the questions, essentially an, an infinite number of questions that any one of us can ask about a single image. You know, there are some questions that are relatively easy today, these days, like what is there, you know, um, maybe some actions, recognition, but there are questions about social interactions or so that are impossible for today's machines. Um, so, as I said, there is a lot of work to do in terms of what go is going on in our brain when we answer this kind of question. And, um, um, and so what we are trying to do at the center is to do quite a lot of empirical science about our brain and our mind. And, uh, uh, the effort is itself an experiment, a meta-experiment. It's an experiment in trying to have computer scientists working with neuro, uh, uh, neuroscientists and with cognitive scientists. Um, so I'll not bore you with this, but let me go to, to one example of what we mean um, in terms of understanding how the brain does um, uh, a specific facet of intelligent behavior. One question is, who is in the image? It's basically face recognition. Now, face recognition um, is, is something that machines, computers, start to do relatively well under controlled conditions. But we want to understand what's going on um, in our brain when we recognize a face. And in the case of face recognition, we know how it develops in infancy. Um, we know that six months old babies can already start to recognize faces. Uh, we also know which parts of the brain, these are patches in visual cortex of about 100,000 neurons each, that are activated in the human brain when we recognize a face. Um, they're called face patches. Um, and um, we can also, these are fMRI, so this is activity you can see um, in, uh, with uh, magnetic resonance in uh, people. And then you can um, look for homolog patches, for homolog areas in the visual cortex of the macaque monkey, which has a very similar visual system and you identify similar patches from the back of the brain to the front, going from um, cells that respond in a different way to specific views of different faces, to neurons up here that are specific for individual faces, but quite invariant to viewpoint. So it gets more powerful as you go um, to the front, and um, since uh, in the macaque monkey we can use electrodes to record from neurons in these patches, find the connectivity between them, and even measure some of the properties of the cells and compare them with models that we develop 
that have a performance in face recognition similar to humans and also predict or are consistent with properties of these cells. So this means understanding what's going on, not only at the algorithm level, but also the levels of the circuits that are involved in doing this, doing face recognition in humans. Okay, so let me spend the last uh, 10 minutes or so on uh, some work in uh, uh, trying to understand why deep learning works as well as it does. So, as I said, a deep learning network is a series of layers. Um, oops, okay. A series of layers, so you present an image, for instance, on one hand, you get a label at the other end. And uh, um, the image net database are images of this type and the network will give you um, what, is, what is in the image in a ranked in terms of likelihood so for instance a squirrel monkey, a leopard and so on and as I said it does pretty well what is going on is pretty simple you have um, a simple processor in each layer this is a neuron, it's actually a very, very, very simplistic version of a neuron. The neuron gets inputs, and each input has a certain weight, so it's a linear combination of the inputs, of the input vector x, and uh, so it's a linear combination, it's a number, and then this number goes through a rectifier. So non-linearity of this type. And this is the output of the unit that, that then goes into the higher layers and the same thing repeats again and again. Now the weights are, um, because before you train the network, are zero or random. And so the weights are the, um, the parameters that you are trying to find by optimizing performance on a network on a large set of data. So your data are um, uh, xi would be the images and zi would be the label. You are trying to minimize the total error over the set of data and the, the, the knobs you are using trying to minimize these are these weights. Now this is a high dimensional non-convex optimization problem. Uh, to give you an idea, there are probably several million parameters um, in a standard deep learning network. Um, and the Optimization is done through stochastic gradient descent. So you are kind of walking in this very large dimensional energy landscape, trying to find minima or local minima, uh, so parameter values that optimize performance over a training set. And networks trained in this way, as I mentioned before, do very well on a number of different tasks. Um, like the Atari games, like image recognition, and so on. Uh, let me skip some of the problems they have, and uh, let me tell you what, the, what is the kind of mathematical or theoretical question. So, until recently, um, classical machine learning tells you that what you should do if you want to learn a function between an input x, so a vector x, maybe very high dimensional, like an image, say one million pixel, and an output y, which can be um, a label, could be um, a binary label, is this this image or is not, is this this category or not, or could be um, a real number, in which case you have a regression problem. 
So you are trying to, to find the function from the input to the output. You are training by finding the minimum of the loss, exactly as before. And you do this with, for instance, you choose a loss function v, could be the square, so the sum of the squares, this would be square errors. You are trying to minimize the square errors, the average square errors over your training set xi from i equal 1 to l. And the way to do it and until now has been to solve this regularized optimization problem in which you have um, the loss here, you might minimize the error, and you have a regularizer that typically imposes some constraint of smoothness on the function you are trying to find. And the way to do this is to impose that the function f belongs to a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and k is the kernel that defines that Hilbert space. k could be, for instance, it's a symmetric function, could be the dot product of x with xi. Um, or could be a Gaussian of the distance between x and xi. And it turns out that when you solve this problem, the solution always has this kind of form. Okay? And this includes classical approximation techniques like splines in one dimension, radial basis functions like Gaussians, and support vector machines, depending on the choice of the loss function. So, this has been the kind of basic algorithm that people have used um, the previous decade. And if you look at this kind of formulation, it gives you, there is a nice theory underlying it. You can say a lot of things about functional spaces and expected errors and generalization and so on. And this type of algorithm corresponds to networks with one hidden layer. So you can imagine uh, this is upside down, you have an input, these are the x before the vector x, in this case two-dimensional, and then you have units which are this k, um, whose activity depends on, you know, for instance the case of the dot product depends on the similarity between xi, which is stored in each one of these, and the incoming vector x. This will be the activity, and then the activities are linear combi combined to produce an output. Now, you can prove that you can approximate any reasonable, any continuous function on a compact interval of n variables in this way. And so, you know, people have essentially had thought that's, that's fine, that's all we need. Uh, let's stick with one hidden layer network. Um, so, you can prove that this, this will represent many inputs and um, one layer with an output. So, there is no reason to use multiple layers if you want to approximate a continuous function. This is already universal. It can approximate any continuous function arbitrarily well. So, the question I was interested in is what do you, does this give you? And interesting, people in the field are really more on the computer hacking side, so they don't, there is no theory known about it. The answer, one of the answers we have right now is that <coughs> if you Assume that the function of n variables, in this case is eight variables, is not a generic function of eight variables, but has a special form, is a function of functions of two variables, for instance. So you see here you have um, a function of two variables, x1 and x2, another function of two variables, x3 and x4, and then you have a function of um, on the output of these two functions. So essentially you have the same structure of this function as in a binary tree. This processor computes a function of these two variables, this one also of two variables, and this one computes a function of the output of these two. So let's, let's call this compositional function, 
And what happens there, by the way, is what I described before. Um, um, you have a number of units in each node here, for instance, computing a linear combination of the dot product between uh, the weights and the vector of input, and then this is a rectifier. The, it's zero if the value of this dot product plus a bias is negative and is the value itself if it's positive. Okay, so it turns out that if a function of n variables, um, let's see, d variables, has this particular structure, then a network of this type, not surprisingly, can approximate it um, within epsilon with a number of parameters that is essentially linear in the dimensionality. You can also approximate it very well within epsilon with a shallow network with one layer, but in this case the number of parameters is exponential in the dimensionality. So th this tells you that from this point of view of number of parameters, complexity of the learning problem, um, deep learning, uh, deep networks are exponentially better than shallow network for this particular class of functions. So there are separate arguments why this set of functions are important and in vision it depends a lot on uh, locality of object it may, uh, and go back to, to uh, property of physics why there are short-range interaction, pairwise interactions, typically. Um, but let's I leave that for a separate discussion because I cannot say very much. But what we can say is uh, that uh, um, the binary tree is actually a kind of Bohr atom, a very simplified but core model that describes all this, uh, the most um, the best neural networks, deep learning networks around. Um, and we can say a lot about this pooling and invariances and extend it to invariance beyond translation to other groups, um, essentially all the affine group and, uh, um, and which are the conditions that allow you to have not only invariance but, but also selectivity to have, not to lose um, the uniqueness of the output. So, um, let me... Um, so, what I'm, the claim I'm making, and this is still unpublished, but is that networks of this type, which are doing... Uh, this one is the last... Um, uh, the last one, the best one developed at Microsoft a few months ago, it has up to 30 or maybe uh, it can be pushed to hundreds of layers. And the claim is that a network like this describes very well what's going on in terms of the mathematics underlying it. Um, there is one uh, last point I want to make it, and, and this is that... Um, 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 people have shown, uh, starting a year or, or two ago, that these uh, networks with 10 layers or so tell you quite a bit about how um, the ventral stream in visual cortex works. So that seems to be a surprisingly close map matching between the properties of the units in the networks and the properties of neurons in the ventral stream. Surprising. I'm still not ready to completely believe it, but it's, it's intriguing. Now, in the meantime, the best performing networks have now like 100 layers. So there is no obvious way of how to map 100 layers into visual cortex. We don't have 100 areas, like five or six or seven. It turns out, that these networks that have 100 layers or so can be um, described or are equivalent, almost equivalent, uh, 
to a network with one layer, but essentially feedback, so what are, is called the recurrent network. Um, essentially, you have, imagine you have discrete time, you have an input, this is a kind of non-linear feedback system. Uh, imagine you have discrete time, so you can unfold this into a series of layers, so feed forward the layers. You can do this also just by essentially the power, the formal power series expansion of a feedback system. The two things are the same. And so the hypothesis comes to, from this is that um, you should not think of this 30 of these 100 layers as 30 layers, each one of which has to be mapped in a visual area, but maybe the 30 layers correspond to one recurrent layer, and this could be mapped in, a, in one of the visual areas, because we know there are recur recurrent connections within them. So that's an, an open, open question. Um, we'll see, but it, it brings some interesting, um, um, it opens some interesting possibilities because instead of having a pure, purely feed forward networks, now we have time involved. And instead of being, having just essentially a static um, input from one image to a label, now there is dynamics involved in the operation of this, uh, um, of these parts of the network. Um, so, uh, so this may bring in into all of this also a bit of dynamical systems and, uh, and interesting um, comparison with the dynamics of brain activities and human performance and so on. Let me finish. There are some empirical simulations here uh, of possible uh, networks of the type V1 and V2, which one is recurrent and IT. But let me finish with this kind of, um, uh, it's not a summary, it's just mentioning one of the key exam problems that I think um, machine learning today, deep learning has. Um, machine learning has been, especially now with deep learning, quite successful and there is also a, a you know, at least for part of it, a mature theory. Um, and this is the kind of big data. You know, the more labeled data you have, like ImageNet, you have one million images, you know the label for each one. The more you have, the better. Um, so this is kind of, and going to infinity, number of labeled data. For instance, Mobileye is training his system for the car uh, with teams of people in Sri Lanka that are labeling images. Okay, you know, this is a car and this is not a car. And so. But of course, this is not how children learn. You don't have to show a child one million images saying this is a car, this is not a car, this is a car. Um, so, in terms of human learning, it seems that we can learn with very few labeled examples. So, and so, the interesting limit may not be n going to infinity, but n going to zero, or you know, very small. <laughs> and I think that's the next horizon for machine learning, and also for trying to put it, to bring it closer to human learning. How do we learn um, like children do, from, you know, small amount of labeled data? So let me finish here, but it will be a very interesting new phase, both for machine learning and neuroscience. Thank you. We can uh, have several questions. Have you ever applied these networks to emotional intelligence? To emotional intelligence? Yeah. Um, well, not in a really deep way, no. That's one of the things we are trying, uh, we are trying to actually work on, we are working on in the center, uh, kind of social intelligence. There is a lot of intelligence. You know, in, in a certain way, you can think of our intelligence as dealing on one hand with physics, you know, recognizing things, recognizing um, 
uh, things that happen in time. Um, but uh, at least uh, as much of it, from the evolutionary point of view, is involved in recognizing others and what they do and what they think they do. So from the point of view of evolution, this part of social intelligence is, is important, recognizing whether it, you know, the, the person or whatever you're, uh, in front of you had bad, bad intentions or not. You know, that's evolutionary kind of critical. So, um, and not very much has been done so far, especially on the side of machine learning or artificial intelligence. We can do things like recognize expressions um, I would say that's about it. But Why is it limited? Sorry? Is it, is it limited by something? Um, it's partly, partly uh, is just that, you know, there are a lot of open problems right now in this field, especially with these new tools, um, that people simply did not have the time or to, to attack so far. So I'm not saying it's impossible. Uh, of course, you know, there is also a lot of basic, uh, let's call it common sense knowledge or contextual knowledge that you need to have in order to understand what's going on. So it's not simply pattern recognition. Do the kind of visual illusions where you can Sometimes you see a baby, sometimes you see two faces facing each other. Those indicate, uh, are those examples of recursion? Could be, yes, could well be. Um, people, again, um, I don't think anybody has tried to do, to use, you know, machine learning to explain or interpret them so that it's an interesting idea could could be tried. Yeah, they seem to involve some kind of bistable, um, you know, phase transition in a dynamical system, definitely, yes. I think, you know, I think for instance, Yanni Alomoinos, I spoke with him today, he was doing some, he's doing some very interesting work in kind of that direction. Yes, I think, you know, the deep learning is certainly not the solution to everything. Uh, it's uh, providing a, a, a powerful module, especially for sensory learning, but then uh, um, that it, we need much more if we want to understand or reproduce intelligence. And language yes. reasoning is a big part of it. My question is that, except for uh, about years ago, about non-presentation, we were using first law logic. And now, are there any new approaches that are more efficient? Well, um, yeah, I don't know. Lang you know, the, the, the <laughs> that's. Uh, um, it's uh, there is this. Um, see, I think a big question that permeates the whole uh, enterprise of trying to understand and reproduce intelligence is how much should we assume is in the genes, and how much comes from experience. Right. So it depends a lot where you stay there, <laughs> and nobody knows the answer really. And the most likely is, you know, it's not one and not the other, it's somewhere in between, but where in between and how it's done, that's one of the big questions about intelligence. How much has evolution learned and how much does the individual learn? Um, there is actually, a, you know, personally I think there is a, an idea that was first proposed at the end of 1800 by an evolutionary scientist called Baldwin. It's called the Baldwin effect. That makes a Darwinian evolution look like Lamarckian. So it looks like there is, um, you know, say an organism in a species which learned to do something which is important to solve for, for survival, say swimming. And, and then his children 
also learn to swim. Okay? So this seems like you know, Lamarck. You learn and you are able to, to um, give the genes, so to speak, the inheritance to your children. But the proposal by Baldur is interesting. Is basically saying, suppose I have an individual that by random mutation has some of the, let's, let's speak about networks, some of the right connections that are needed to learn to swim, right? So if you don't have half of these connections set right, you don't have enough time in your life to learn to swim. But this individual has half of the connections set right, so he can learn, since it has a general learning machine, he can learn to swim. And then his children inherit the 50% correct random connection, since they also inherit the general learning machine, they can also learn to swim, right? And if you argue this way, my conclusion is that basically everything that is, every um, ability that is sophisticated enough to require, uh, uh, you know, so that you are dealing with an organism that has a general learning capability. So almost ev everything will be partially determined by the genes, but also by, by learning from the experience, because there will be no evolutionary pressure to push everything on the gene side once you have this general, general learning machine that can do you know, half or whatever part of the job. So I, I think that's... Can you uh, use uh, mathematicians in your center? Um, if, if not, or if you do, what sort of expertise would you like them to have to contribute? Right. Yeah. Well, I'm collaborating with mathematicians, and there is at least one. It's more applied mathemat mathematics, harmonic analysis, and so on. It's a kind of part of machine learning on the last few years. Function approximation, um, kind of uh, splines, wavelets, and uh, um, you know, th there is all this uh, kind of more applied math that is directly relevant. Uh, I'm sure there will be more, and you know I really hope that so far the story in deep learning in the last three, four, five years has been um, a community that is not caring at all about theory or mathematics <laughs> and only care about you know programs that work and uh, so the, the 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 push has been uh, forget about why this works but as long as it works. And I hope there will be a theory, <laughs> because in the, in the sense, theory in the sense of theorems, right? Um, so part of my interest is also in this meta question of hoping that there is still space, not just for simulations, but for actually proving some condition. Because there is also a very big limit to simulations when you have two million parameters or something like this. You know, there are so many things you can, you can try that it's uh, hopeless. And, and it will be interesting to know if to deal with uh, small data, you need bigger machines or... <laughs> <laughs> right. So let's use the opportunity to thank again.